beautiful way to start off our morning together. Thank you so much, Lenny. Uh, welcome to Calvary. It is so wonderful to see all of you this morning. Thank you for joining us for worship on this beautiful Sunday. I hope everybody enjoyed the 80 degree weather yesterday. What an interesting spring we seem to be uh, going into. Uh, but my name is Dagny. I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary. And before we continue on in worship, I just have a couple quick announcements to share with all of you. And the first is that at 1 p.m. today over in the worship center, we are having our confirmation service. We are so excited to be confirming, I think, 10 students this year, and we're so excited, and we just can't wait to celebrate with them and their families this afternoon, um, to celebrate all the ways that God has worked in their lives, and to celebrate all of the ways that God will continue to work in their life. These students are affirming the faith uh, that their parents placed in them uh, when they were either baptized or dedicated as a child, um, and so we're really excited to be able to join with them as a congregation uh, to stand by our promise that we made as well to support them and uplift lift them in their faith journey. So we really hope that you'll be able to join us over in the worship center at one o'clock to celebrate with these confirmation students. So we hope to see you there. Uh, finally, uh, the last announcement this morning is to inform you of several deaths that we've had in the congregation. Audrey Johnson, Larry Bakken, Joyce Selness, Sharon Stavrovich, Ruth Davidson, Lois Biederman, and Erna Talifer. And we ask that you would join us in praying for their friends and family as they mourn their loss and as they look toward the hope that we have in Jesus and his resurrection. So why don't we do that now? Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we give you thanks this morning for all of the incredible blessings that you pour out to us through our friends and our family and our loved ones. And Lord, this morning we specifically lift up the family and friends of Audrey, Larry, Joyce, Sharon, Ruth, Lois, and Erna. Surround them with your love and fill them with your peace and comfort as they mourn the loss of their loved one, uh, as they prepare to celebrate their lives. And Lord, we ask that you stir their hearts and turn their eyes to you, uh, knowing that you are good, that you are with them, and that in you we live. Lord, thank you for your son that we celebrated not too long ago that he rose from the dead, that he defeated sin and death and the grave once and for all, and that we have a lifetime to look forward to in the kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as you are able and greet the people around you, and we will sing our opening hymns together.
seated. morning service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment now for silent reflection and self-examination. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. Praise you for your glory, Lord Jesus. 
as you are able, and let us confess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this point in each one of our services, we like to take a moment to talk about the giving of our tithes and offerings. We know that we serve an incredibly generous God and that we are called to reflect that generosity back to him with our own generosity, whether it's with our time, our energy, and even our finances. And we like to talk about it in worship because we believe that it is another form of worship, another way that we come before the Lord and pour of ourselves into his hands that he might use our gifts and our offerings for the expansion of his kingdom. So thank you so much for partnering with us on our mission to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus in this way. Would you please pray with me over our offering this morning? Heavenly Father, we come before you just in awe of the ways that you are generous to us with your mercy and with your love and with your forgiveness. And God, we especially thank you for the ways that you were generous with your son, Lord, that he came, lived among us, died for us, and then rose again that we might be in relationship with you. God, this morning we ask that you take our tithes and offerings and use them as you see fit for the betterment of your kingdom. Lord, help us to turn our eyes to you and to loosen our grip on the things of this world, but to lay them at your feet, trusting that you will do with them what needs to be done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Scripture reading this morning is Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. O oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. And in this parched and weary land, there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night, because you are my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. Here ends the reading. Well, good morning. Welcome to worship at Calvary. All of you here in the worship center, everybody over in the chapel and anyone watching online, we're so glad that you have joined us. You know, we typically don't have much of a problem pursuing something that we don't have, but we really, really want. We're willing to go the extra mile. We're willing to figure out a plan. We're willing to be very intentional when there's something that we want that we don't have. And a lot of that is a pursuit. You know, we might be pursuing a new opportunity at work. And so we make sure that we're going to step up, we're going to volunteer for things, we're going to network. There's a lot of steps that we can try to take if we're pursuing something at work. We might be pursuing a new friendship. And so you want to be extra intentional about trying out a new activity or making an effort to check in and to invest into those relationships. We might be pursuing a healthier lifestyle. And so we're more intentional about uh, how we eat and how we exercise and what we do day to day. Or you might be pursuing a, a significant other and we're willing to spend a whole lot of time and effort and energy and care to try to bring that about. Now, I remember when Lexi and I started dating and I found out that she loved to play softball and I went to more softball games that summer than ever before in my whole life because I knew it was something that she loved to do. She also sang in her church's Saturday night worship team and I was at every single Saturday service. I wanted to find out her favorite restaurant, what she would do in her spare time, what her favorite movies were, what her favorite music was. Because when we want something we don't have, we're willing to pursue it. And when we're pursuing someone, we especially wanna know what they love to do, what they're all about, what's close to their heart. You know, even if it's things that we don't naturally gravitate towards, suddenly we're open, right, to these new things. Because again, we have a vision of what the future could be. Now, maybe you have some similar stories in your life, a time that you drove through the night just to see your person. 
Or maybe a time that you splurged and you bought the concert tickets that you knew your friend or your significant other would be super excited about. Or maybe the times that you spent hours on the phone and just appreciated hearing each other's voice. But you know, I think we also sometimes get to the point in our relationships, in our marriages, where things don't feel that energized and that intentional, where things start to feel routine and distant and disconnected. And we might wonder what in the world happened? Why is it so different than it once was? And I think one of the main reasons for that is we sometimes stop pursuing each other. We stop being intentional and thoughtful. Now, instinctively, we know this is a recipe for disaster because almost nothing in life gets better when you just leave it alone. Almost nothing in our lives gets better if we aren't intentional, if we're not trying to move forward. Good things don't happen typically by default. Now, I don't remember a lot from physics class back in high school, but I do remember Newton's first law of motion, which says objects in motion stay in motion, objects at rest stay at rest. And I think that law is pretty good to describe our relationships. When our relationships lose momentum, when we lose commitment, when we lose priority, well, they tend to stay at rest. And even worse, they can atrophy and they can become severely damaged. So whether it's our body, whether it's our business, whether it's our backyard lawn, whether it's our relationships and our marriages, I think it means actively pursuing a better future through commitment, through hard work, and by trying to move forward. So we're in this sermon series called Committed Relationships. And we're just looking at how we can create healthier relationships, healthier marriages. Because those things, every one of our relationships don't happen by accident. And so in this series, we're looking at four important commitments that can be hugely influential in our marriages, in our friendships, and in every other relationship. And those four commitments are the commitments of priority, pursuit, partnership, and honesty. And so if you were here last week, Pastor Dogney did a fantastic job kicking off the series by talking about the first commitment of priority. And the commitment that we talked about making is this, I promise that God will be my first priority. You know, it's so often that we get things out of whack and out of order in our life. Sometimes we can end up idolizing our relationships. And so this is a reminder that God always comes first. Our spouse, our friends, our other relationships, they come second. This is how God designed life to be. Well, today I wanna talk about our second priority, our second commitment. It's our commitment of pursuit. And the commitment that I think is important for us to make in our relationships is this, I promise to continue to pursue the person or the people that I love. I promise to continue to pursue the person or the people that I love. You know, from the very beginning of time, God has been pursuing us. After Adam and Eve sinned against God in the first chapters of Genesis, The next thing they did is they ran away and tried to hide from him. But you know what God did is he continued to pursue them and he actually called them out in chapter two, verse nine. He just says, where are you guys? He loved to take walks in the garden. He loved to spend time with his beloved creation. And so in the very first chapters of the Bible, we see that God is willing to pursue people even when we sin, even when we separate ourselves from him, even when we are disconnected from a healthy relationship with him. Now, if you were here on Easter, we looked in depth at Luke chapter 15, at Jesus's parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost 
son. And we talked about how Jesus's mission on earth, he said, was to seek and to save the lost. He was on a mission of pursuit. Jesus says he's willing to leave the 99 to go find the one lost sheep and that he'll open his arms wide to anyone who wants to return to a relationship with him. Now, God's passionate and relentless pursuit of you and me led him to sending his only son to die in our place. Because we can never get it truly figured out. We can never work our way to him. So he came to pursue us and to take care of all of the details for us. He became the way for us to return to God. Now, the amazing thing about God's heart and mission is he pursues us even when we're stuck, even when we're stubborn, even, scripture says, when we're obstinate. Look at Isaiah 65, where God says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me to a nation that did not call on my name. I said, here I am, here I am. All day long, I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. Even when we rebel, even when we're stuck, even when we're distant, God still pursues us. Now, Jesus continued that mission, that heart for pursuit, And then after his death and his resurrection, he gave his followers a mission, a pursuit. He says, go and make disciples, go and be my witnesses to every nation, tribe, and tongue. And so we are charged, we're called to follow him. And when we fall short, he's still not done pursuing us. He pursues us again through the Holy Spirit reminding us again and again of his love and his grace and his presence in our life. And all the while forming us into the image of his son, Jesus. Now, can you think of anything more amazing than the truth that you are the object of the God of the universe's pursuit? That you are worthy of his creativity and his power and his persistence. So when it comes to all of our relationships, to our marriages, to our friendships and all the rest, they won't grow, they won't be healthy. And sadly, they often won't last without a commitment to pursuit. So again, in the book of Genesis, God invents the institution of marriage between the first man and the first woman. Look at Genesis 2.24, where it says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Now the word I wanna focus in there is united. Now it's not probably you know, very confusing or surprising that that word would be used because when we think of marriage, when we think of relationships, of course, we want there to be a uniting. But when we look at the Hebrew word that's used there, there's even more depth, I think, to what is being talked about. You see, it's the Hebrew word dalbak, and it means to cling to and to stick close to. But another definition of this word is to pursue closely, to pursue hard after someone or something. Now, I think, again, this is a perfect word to describe God's position or God's outlook towards us, the lengths he'll go for us, but it's also what we are supposed to have for each other. Now, I want to look at a few other places in scripture where the same Hebrew word is used. First, let's look at Psalm 63, two different translations. One, I follow close to you, or another says, my soul pursues you. You see, it's again, our posture towards God. It's a pursuit after him. In Job 41, it takes on more of a relational kind of idea. It says they are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Or look at Judges chapter 20. 
now used in kind of a war motif. It says they pursued them relentlessly. Again, this word means to follow closely, to pursue relentlessly, to be joined fast, to be united. Because you see, that is what our souls are designed to need and long for. And one of my very first, or one of my very favorite stories about pursuit in the Bible is the story of Jacob and Rachel. You might remember this story. There's two sisters. Leah is the name of the older sister and Rachel is the name of the younger sister. And this is what the Bible actually says in Genesis 29, 17. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Can you believe that that's what Moses decided to write about these two women, right? Basically, Rachel is gorgeous, Leah needs glasses, right? Or, you know, like if Moses was at least a little bit kind, he could have said, Leah had a really nice personality or something like that, right? But instead, no, weak eyes. Well, Jacob came and he fell in love with the younger sister, with Rachel, and he wants to marry her. And he is ready to do anything to be able to do this. So her father Laban said, I'll take that deal. You work for me for seven years and then you can have her hand in marriage. And so that's exactly what Jacob did. He was willing to work for seven years because all along he's just dreaming about his love for Rachel. And so the years flew by And finally, the day came, but Laban conned Jacob and said he would give him Leah instead of Rachel. And Jacob said, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. I wanted to marry Rachel. And Laban said, well, you know, in our culture, it's customary to marry off the oldest daughter first. But Jacob was resolute because of his deep, deep love For Rachel. He's still intent on winning her hand. Now, a lot of people believe that the story goes that Jacob required, or Laban required Jacob to work another seven years before he could marry Rachel. But that's not actually what happened. Laban gave Rachel to him first and then said, now you owe me another seven years, which I think actually is even more powerful a more powerful illustration of Jacob's commitment to pursue Rachel. Jacob worked for her even after he had her. Even after he had received this gift, he was willing to do seven more years of hard labor. And you know, I think in many ways, that's the kind of heart that God wants us to have in our marriages and in our relationships to be willing to continue to pursue the people that we've been blessed to love. And so whether you're dating or whether your friendship is fresh and new, it's important to continue to pursue each other. You know, in the, the beginnings of these relationships, we're often willing to do even the littlest things. You know, maybe write notes, be extra thoughtful, I remember when Lexi and I started dating, I set out to make her the perfect mixtape. Well, I think at that time, you know, we were still burning CDs. And so it was like love song, love song, maybe a worship song, air supply, maybe something else emotionally sappy. Totally destroyed my indie rock loving credit, but I did not care because I was pursuing her. But again, I think what happens to many people, especially after maybe we've been married for a few years or decades, once the relationship has been established, is the desire to pursue each other starts to fade away because there's so much busyness, so many distractions. It's easy to take each other for granted. Now I've done many, many weddings throughout my ministry, but I've never had a couple who said on day one, you know what, I wanna have a really bad marriage someday. You know, I wanna have 10 years, you know, maybe we'll have some, some good times together. There'll be some intimacy, but you know, in about 10 years, we wanna break it apart. We're gonna to have to split everything and go our separate ways. Absolutely no one sees that in their future. We all start out with the best of intentions. 
We love each other, but life begins to wear us down. I mean, we want to show our love for each other, but then we end up not doing it. So I want to share three basic principles I think that will help us remain committed to pursuit in our relationships. Three simple principles that are really about closing the gap between intention and action. You know, it's one thing to intend to do something, it's another to actually follow through on it. Now these three, com- or these three principles are things that I first heard articulated by Craig Groeschel. And I wanna admit to you right up front, I am not an expert in these things. I'm gonna be as convicted or more than anyone else here. Because when it comes to these things, I definitely need to grow each and every day. And if my wife were here right now, she'll be at the next service, she'd probably yell amen right now. So the first principle to help us remain committed to pursuit is this, when you think of something good, say it. When you think of something good about the other person, actually say it. This is something that can impact your marriage, your friendship, any relationship almost instantaneously. Every time you think of something good about the other person, actually be willing to say it. In Hebrews 3.13, it says, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. If you wanna keep the deceitfulness of sin away from your marriage, away from your friendships, then find ways to encourage and uplift each other daily. Don't put it off, don't wait for those holidays or birthdays to come around or the days that you're supposed to go buy a greeting card. No, each and every day find ways to encourage and uplift each other, find something good to say, it's worth it. The other person needs to hear it. I mean, think for a moment how many times something good comes into your head, but then you fail to ever share it. I know for me, it literally happens all the time. You know, like, oh, I should really say this, but then I get sidetracked or I have a meeting coming up and I forget to ever follow through. Now, I wanna talk in generalities for a moment. So try not to be offended by this. Know that yes, all of us are created unique and different, and we might gravitate towards different ways of thinking or living. But I think there are some basic commonalities too that we can talk about, especially between the genders. So first of all, I wanna talk to all the guys out there. When it comes to your significant other, you need to pursue her with words of affection. Now, don't get the wrong idea. These are non-sexual words of affection. And one practical way that you can do this is anytime you say the words, I love you, add one more word, because. I love you because. Be specific. I love you because of how much you care. I love you because of your smile. I love you because of your intentionality. Pursue her with affection because it instills tremendous value and blessing into her. Now, ladies, pursue him with words of affirmation. Now, some of you might remember times in your life when someone has been very good at telling you what you are not. You're not good at this. You are not going to be able to do this. You're not talented enough. But when someone sees potential in us and then calls it out, it causes us to rise to the occasion. And so be intentional about telling him what you see him becoming. Now, I think this is especially important spiritually. Affirm the steps of faith that he's taking. You know, I so appreciated your prayer at dinner, or I so appreciated that we were able to worship together as a family. So really at a root level, and again, like I said, maybe you gravitate towards one or the other and as well, we all need affirmation, we all need affection. But at a really base level, Men, what she wants to know every day is, do you love me 
today. And women, what guys need to know every day is do you believe in me today? And you see our commitment to pursuit means being proactive enough to share these words with each other. Well, number two, another principle is when you think of something special, do it. James 4, 17 says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Anytime you think of something good that could be a blessing to the other person, actually do it. You know, maybe come home from work early, help clean up the house, bring takeout on a busy day. Maybe just say, hey, let's go for a walk. It's a beautiful day. Or let's buy tickets to the game or the show that you really wanna see. You know, as we look towards our spouse or a friend or a kid or a neighbor, if we see stress in their lives, what are some ways we can help alleviate that stress? Maybe it's an overwhelming week. Maybe everything seems to be going wrong. I think instinctively we know what to do, but we don't always follow through. Empty the dishwasher, help the kids get ready for bed, send over some flowers, plan a getaway. Do something your spouse or your friend really wants to do that you might not even enjoy doing. You know, watch a chick flick instead of an action movie. Get, you know, something a little nicer than fast food sometime. Think of something that will be a blessing to the other person and then do it. Again, I think we know what we should do, but for a variety of reasons, too often we fail to do it. Well, then third and finally, when you want something different, be it. Don't be tempted to turn this message or some of these themes around on the other person and be like, this is what you need to do. No, this is all about what we can do individually to be who God created us to be. You see, when we open ourselves up to God's power and his transformation, then we can be made new. Look at what it says in Ezekiel 36. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It starts with us. We can't change anyone else, but through God's power, through his love, through his transformation, we can be formed into completely new people. Now, maybe some of you are kind of like me and you have a hard time being told what to do, right? I just always kind of rebel against like, go do this or you should change this. But when I see my wife doing something intentionally, you know, maybe putting her phone aside, being more present with our kids and our family, well, that example is what I need to do the same. Suddenly I wanna be more attentive and more present you know, again, we can't change anyone else, but we can change ourselves. And often that is one of the most impactful and positive things we can do for our relationship. So again, our second commitment is a commitment of pursuit, saying, I promise to continue to pursue the person or the people that I love. It's about not being content to let our relationships go stale. And what I wanna close with is one more reminder. And that's this, to get what you once had, you must do what you once did. You know, maybe you remember when your relationship or your marriage was fresh and new and exciting and you felt close and connected and you're thinking today, it's totally not how I'd, I would describe where we're at. Well, what you need to remember is you had it before and you can have it again. And you actually know what to do. You need to be intentional and creative and thoughtful like you once were. You need to recommit to pursuing your spouse or your friends, whomever it is you want a closer relationship with. So church, keep God as your first priority. And then don't forget to continue to pursue the person or the people that you love. 
Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you are a God of pursuit, that even though we are sinful and rebellious and unlovable, you still pursue us with your love and your grace. God, help us to bring that commitment into all of our relationships, to continue to pursue the people we love with intentionality, with thoughtfulness, with creativity. Help us to instill value in each other by the words we choose, the actions we choose. God, we're thankful for the blessing of you in our lives and the blessing of each other. Help us to remain committed to the relationships you've given us. God, we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus and let's all say together, amen. By praying the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If there's any way that we can be praying for you this morning, we're going to have members of our prayer team up at the front after the service who would love to pray with you. Please stand as you are able to receive the blessing. As we go from here this morning, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.